What's going on, everybody? My name is Danny, a.k.a. Captain Sin. This is Chatting with Captain, recorded live on kick, kick.com slash the Captain Sin. Brought to you by Blackcraft Cult. You can use code SIN at checkout for 15% off. And Smoke Blackcraft, you can use code Captain Sin for 15% off. Help support the channel. Awesome people, awesome brand. Love it. My guest today is touring with Corn and Five Finger Death Punch and has his own side project i don't know what genre it is we're going to talk about that with all the damn vampires davy oberlin how's it going hey how's it going good man going thanks good. for having me of course um so now that we are getting into that what do you consider all the damn vampires because there's like 30 different genres that i feel like it could fit into yeah i mean it definitely takes influence from all of those genres and sub genres but uh, i would just call it synth pop yeah yeah that that actually yeah, I can see that. Um, it's funny because today is actually my three-year anniversary of starting all of this content creation stuff. And it was also the exact time that I discovered you, which was through the Blackcraft Twitch streams. Because you oh, had premiered okay, a couple cool. videos there. And yeah, congrats on uh, the anniversary. I appreciate that. But I was I was working with them on their Twitch. I was a moderator for them. And over you know over time it just snowballed now i'm endorsed and everything which is awesome but did you uh how was your covid was it productive or did you just like kind of stay hunkered down or did you like really like work work yeah i uh i still worked a lot actually all the damn vampires was my main focus during covid um and then i started really like putting a lot behind my um, artwork, which ended up transpiring into an NFT project in a line called the Boneheads. Mm. So uh, I'd say it was pretty busy. I mean, definitely there was no touring going on. I got a few offers, but I just figured they'd get canceled or it would just be kind of a nightmare to travel and deal with all that. So, I mean, during that whole thing, I just, I, I think I wanted to just take that time to myself to uh, build these things that I was neglecting during the corn tours because we were so busy with corn. I didn't really have a lot of time for myself and for my passion projects. So yeah, that was, a, it was actually a much needed uh, kind of forced mandatory break. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it was one of two ways. Either people got a lot of stuff that they had been sitting on for a while done, or they just stayed hunkered down and didn't do anything at all. It was kind of just like in between. Yeah. Um, that since... always surprised me. Like when anybody would tell me that they like, Oh, I got really out of shape during COVID. I'm like, really? I was like, for me, I was like, Oh, pandemic, everybody's getting sick. If you're healthier, better off. I'm just going to get healthier. So yeah. <laughs> did more cardio worked out more. Um, so you just recently dropped synth city. Was that planned out from the beginning with all the singles or did that just come about later on? That kind of came about later on. I was looking at like how some of the singles were doing really well and I was really stoked on them. But at the same time, I, the within that period of a year or two that I had written some of the first ones, my abilities with production, mixing, mastering were greatly enhanced. So I was like, I want to go back. I want to upgrade these mixes, do them justice. And then I want to make a compilation of all these tracks that I love. So I had a bunch already done, but unreleased. And I was like, I'm saving these for a full length. Um, I know that right now, like a lot of people are just putting out singles. It's kind of a singles climate, you know, especially for um, DSPs or digital streaming platforms. So doing a full length isn't necessarily advantageous, but in synth wave, retro wave, that those sub genres of synth pop, um, having a full length, I feel like is really appropriate. And some of my favorite artists did. So I was like, this is really important to me to have a full length done. So that's kind of how Sin City transpired. You got a lot of really good vocalists on that album. And the first one I definitely want to talk about is Mint Simon. Super, super underrated, I think. How did you guys hook up? Yeah. So Mint uh, was on a track that I had heard called Restless Nights. Um, and uh, I, I was just blown away. I heard the voice and I was like, this is the most... Like if I was going to be driving right now through New York City at 2 a.m. and people were shooting at me or you know, there was hologram posters or whatever, like this is the voice um, and this is the track. So I wrote uh, the artist behind that and I was like, hey, I was like, who is this? Because it wasn't there was no credit on the track. Um, so 
he let me know where to look for mint i reached out and i was like i love your voice i have this track i need some vocals and top lines i would call it saturday the idea the emotion is a b and c and then mint took it from there um sent me back to work and i was like this is incredible i love it and that that song became saturday and we we uh decided to write a lot more together and actually mint is in uh, america right now so mint's normally in canada but mint's here in america so we're going to be getting together and writing some more new stuff so i'm, nice. I'm really looking forward to that um but yeah I, I i really am at the point where i'm like every time i hear you know all the damn vampires i think i think of mint's voice and i think a lot of people do too so mm -hmm. i i feel like i gotta actively continue to uh you know collaborate and we, i think we just work really well together there's a lot of magic there and and they're just such a good uh you know, songwriter and, and top line artist. So, uh, yeah, that mint was just a, a shot in the dark and it, it worked <laughs> out. And now here we are. We're, we're, we're very close. I know it's like when you listen to those songs, it sounds like their voice is coming straight from the eighties almost like if they, if you would have told me, Oh yeah, they were a pop star in the eighties. I'd believe in a second, just like the, everything about yeah. it. It's nuts. Yeah. That's the magic. It's kind of, it, it's, it works in a sense where, you know, the retro, the nostalgia, all of that comes through, but at the same time, the voice, the voice is timeless. And so it's like, you know, if, if, if you put these songs together and then you hear Mint's voice, it just resonates, you know, young and old, like people of all generations that have heard the stuff with Mint on it have just been like, wow, this is, I love this voice. <laughs> you know? Yes, I agree. Um, there was another person you had on that I've had on the podcast before, uh, James Hart from 18 visions. One of the nicest dudes I have oh, ever yeah. talked to. Yeah. Um, yeah. How long have you guys known each other? Cause I know you've been in that scene for a long time. Oh man. Uh, James is a good friend. I, I love James. He's, he's a legend. Um, I think we've known each other almost going on 20 years now. I, the first time we ever met, we played a show together at chain reaction. My old band parish had uh, signed a deal and the label owner's daughter was a big 18 visions fan so he put on a private show for her and her birthday and all her friends in high school and everything and so it was like it was parish it was 18 visions it was really cool and then keith barney and i ended up uh linking up a lot to write music and you know we played in some projects together we did a project with like keith from 10 foot pole steve from unbroken matt from adamantium myself and, and keith barney from 18 visions throwdown and it was like it was like butt rock with breakdowns, you know, <laughs> like we were just having fun. Uh, Keith, Keith's played in, in my project, the destroyer that I was doing with buddy from droid for a little bit. So, you know, we just have this long history of collaborating and, uh, I had that track runaway dreams instrumental for a while. And I, I was like, all right, let me just do the most over the top, almost cheesy, like guitar driven kind of synth song for fun. And I ended up loving it. And everybody I played it for was like, this is rad. Like the melody's super cool. It's kind of like a, a little bit of a Terminator to call back, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I was like, okay, who would be perfect for this? So I kind of want like Skid Row, Ozzy Osbourne, and boom, like James. It was perfect. And it's it's the most unique track on the album. It's totally different from everything else. But um, I'd been wanting to do something with James for a while, so it it was really cool that like he was down. We we tracked it with Keith with Keith Barney. Um, one night we had just all got together, grabbed some coffee, and yeah, he just laid down the track like almost in one take. So it was really cool to do. He's a, he's a very, very underrated vocalist, not just screamer, but like his singing is insane as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think a, a, people are very particular about their vocals, you know, but like there's just some really undeniable vocalists. And I think a really important quality is that you immediately know who it is when you hear it, you know? And so like, I, I think you can probably agree with me on that on Sin City that a lot of the vocalists are they just sound like them, you know, you don't listen to it and think, Oh, maybe it's this person. It's you look at their name and like, that's them forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You can, it's instantly like right away. You can tell. Um, another person I had on actually shouted you out and that was Billy Martin from good Charlotte. He said that you oh, were the yeah. reason that he got into producing because you guys had hooked up in Australia, I think he said, and then he hooked, you hooked yeah. him up with Morgoth. And that kind of just let it all down. He said that you are the reason he's a producer right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Billy's great. We, uh, I remember I was out there with Corn. We were headlining like Warp Tour Australia or something. And all the Limp Biscuit guys and Good Charlie guys were all staying at 
the hotel we were at. And I, I have a good friend that I've been friends with for a while. And he's, he's a pretty humble, quiet guy. We call him skinny. Um, he actually helped me learn a lot about, you know, mixing as well, but skinny's brother plays drums for good Charlotte. And so we're all standing in the, the hotel lobby and we're talking and we're talking about Zed and skinny is Zed's engineer. And I'm just, uh, I, was, I was talking about people that are really good at producing and production. And, all, and I started mentioning skinny and they're like, Oh, skinny. That's, that's, you know, so-and-so's brother. I was just like, what? Like small <laughs> world. That's crazy. Then Billy and I just got in the conversation about production and yeah, I mentioned uh, Morgoth and I, I never thought that the connection would happen so well and so quick, but you know, uh, Michael or Morgoth, he's like me where he's just like, let's do it, man. Like, you know, if we connect and we talk about something, we're going to do it uh, and we get on it quick. Otherwise it just kind of goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really cool to see that, that happen, you know, and I, I, I kind of get busy and I don't really keep up well. So I come back after all this time and I look and I see this progress being made or these connections. And it, it really makes me happy to, you know, be able to connect dots like that. Yeah. I, I thought it was crazy like how everything all of these people that i've had on previously all have connections to you in some way now so it's like everything has just kind of <laughs> meshed perfectly <laughs> um <laughs> the nft thing how did you get into the nfts because he had also talked about that because he has his own nfts as well and he said that yeah know, that is a big thing how did you get into nfts <laughs> that that one's kind of crazy because so i i didn't really know what i was going to do with my art with boneheads in uh, particular and I had a friend of mine who uh, is this like kick-ass attorney and he commissioned me to do art at his place. And so basically every wall of his home is one of my boneheads, like on a, in a framed canvas, you know, nice and big. And he represents a lot of clients. So he had a, a client in the NFT space come through and his team looked at him and was like, oh my gosh, like who, what is this? Who did this? And then they're like, this needs to be NFTs. And so they asked if I would uh, meet up with them for lunch excuse me. So I, I went and met up and they basically proposed to me, you know, that they could help me get the ball rolling and figure out the, the web three space and do like NFTs. So, um, I was like, you know what, let's do it. This is the right timing. This is the right, I think, um, web three is really cool for art because of the power it gives artists and because of the way that it branches to like mixed media and different types of media. So, uh, yeah, that, I got on fire about it and then, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, it's still the wild west, you know? So it was cool. It worked out really well, but then there was, there was a lot of, you look at it and you think, okay, this brand is going to go for, you know, two, four years, maybe even longer. And this is how it's going to work. And this is how it's going to look. You try to plan it like that, but with web three, you really can't do that. So it's like, all right, we had this really great first drop. We want to do more, but now it's like, it doesn't make sense because this happened, that happened, Ethereum backs it, Ethereum's down. So it's kind of crazy. I'm just like trying to take this art and turn it into a brand that's going to be, you know, on toothpaste. It's going to be you know, on Cartoon Network, you know, so not just Web3, but the fact that like it can exist there, that people can have these tokens uh, from the very like first inception of it. I hope we'll, I, ho I don't want to speculate on value or suggest, you know, anything like that. This isn't financial advice, but <laughs> I, I hope that the things that I do later on with the brand will give value to the people that invested in those original tokens. Like that's like my, my goal, you know, because it's just a, it's a really neat group of people. It's a lot of people that are like music fans that might have taken interest in, in me because I played with corn or I played with five finger death punch or whatever I've done, you know, but I'm just happy that um, I could get my art around and people appreciate it and especially enough to, to buy it, you know, and, and that helps support me do other things like music and art. Do you think people have written off, nfts and crypto too early because it seems like the internet's really um, kind of shitting on it lately yeah I, well you know I, I think the problem with that is is the expectations like i said it's the wild west but people were coming in delivering expectations and promises that would be deliverable if it wasn't the wild wild west you know if it was like set in stone so i think a lot of people got their hopes up they had the wrong ideas and that's unfortunate and that might have definitely dampened how web three is gonna you know work out into a functioning thing like that's totally normal in society um i think people might be writing it off right now they might be hating it but the large corporations and the companies that are investing in that technology and are using it are going to eventually roll that out in a way that's sustainable and people are going to have to get on board with that if they want to you know it's just like when we got the new iphones 
I'm like, you know, 90 years old. So I was there when the iPhone first came out, but, um, but you know, it was like, it was a shocker. It was like, dude, I, I just use my phone to play like snake and text my friends like primitively with like the letters on the, the numbers. And then I get this iPhone. I'm like, Oh, I got to learn this whole thing, man. They want my identity. Like, this is crazy. But if I didn't get on board with that, I'd be missing out in all the way to come and all the advantages. So I, I see that happening with web three as well. It's just going to smooth out people that are making these wild promises and then making a ton of money and dipping out. I think they're, they're just going to be the, uh, the sad history lesson from web three that everybody's eventually going to move on from. Hmm. And then, uh, like Avenge sevenfold is doing, you know, their tickets through NFTs now, which is crazy. Like, but I mean, with yeah. it, it's yeah. kind of working out perfectly for them with all of the the shit that Ticketmaster is going through with all the upcharges and all the stuff that's going on. Like, it's totally scalpers. Yeah, I I I think it's a decent idea. It might be a little too early for people to like really like back it, but like you said, mm -hmm. doing it early is what you're gonna have to do if you want to be ahead of the game. Yeah, totally. And the first person I called when I was trying to figure out, you know, this NFT drop, you know, because I, I had some some people advising me, but I wanted a second opinion. So the first person I called was Shadows, you know, and Shadows, I, I called them real quick. And I was like, dude, like, I'm doing this thing, but I'm nervous, man. Like, what's value? Like, what do I give? And he's like, he's like, you got to give them five free mints on, you know, your second drop. That would be really cool. And this, that, and the other. And I was just like, yeah, that's a great idea, man. Like, I'm totally down. So, um, you know, he's, he's really genuine about it. He's really focused. I know Sinister is too. He brought, kind of brought everybody into the fold and, um, you know, they're, they're still, they believe in it strongly and they're going to utilize that. Um, and I think the stuff they're offering the death bats community is pretty one of a kind. Like we used to always have like, you know, a Halloween party. We go to like Johnny Christ and we'd have Halloween parties at his house. But now it's like their community can come to these Halloween parties. It's at a different location, but you know because they own a death bat, they can just come and like hang and party with their favorite bands. Like that's kind of crazy if you yeah. think about it. You know, like that never would have been possible. I mean, um, imagine like if Bieber did that. You know, like the oh insanity <laughs> that would ensue. Like, um, so they they've been really smart about it and they're really responsible. And um, the cool thing about the Avenge fans is like how respectful and. Um, they don't really take advantage of the fact that they're being let in, you know, it's mm. behind the curtains. Um, so that works out really well with, with web three and, you know, things being tokenized. There's, you're not going to get somebody in there that forged it, you know, because you got your wallet, you got your transaction history. It's kind of cool. It's smart. And it, it, uh, it gives a little bit of accountability so that the bands aren't vulnerable for letting people in that might be a little bit more fanatical or like, you know, th that could take advantage of that. Right. Well, that's like the crazy thing about the internet now is like fans can connect to their bands so easily now. And like back in the day, you would have never been able to do that because you would have had to have gone through like five record labels and three attorneys and everything else. And like, especially like this, like I sent you a message on Twitter and we just kind of snowballed from there. And that was, that was basically it. Like back in the day that would have never happened. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, I think people would send like fan mail and it would actually be like a physical letter or something <laughs> like who, who knows who's reading that, you know, it's kind of crazy, but yeah. I mean, the, the doors are open now. A lot of like really cool contacts I've made or people that I've worked with, you know, I just cold called them basically. You just DM them on Instagram or when I signed with metal blade records, we needed a manager. Someone recommended a manager and I wrote him on Facebook. <laughs> I was like, he's going to think I'm crazy. So I, I wrote him and then, couple phone calls later here we are we're working with a great manager and uh he ended up becoming like a lifelong friend he manages zed he manages norma gene you know so we all came together through this this one person and have stayed that way and um I, I think that's it's really important to be able to kind of um take some of the gatekeeping out because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are hungry artists that are genuine and that need to have that chance because they're about to change and do something really cool or like connect some dots, you know, and, and somebody's going to be producing the next hit. That was my big thing with this. Like I got in with Bobby from black craft so that helped a little bit with everything, but mostly everybody that I've had on, it's literally just been like, Hey, I'm hit you up on Twitter real quick. What's up. This is what I've done so far. Would you like to do it? And, almost every single person has instantly been like, yeah, let's do it. Fuck it. You know? 
and which is great. We have talked about this. I talked about this with Billy. Um, people tend to forget that artists are just people and they just like having conversations about their art. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I think there was a, there was a time when it was really important for artists to seem like these untouchable rock stars that were on this pedestal, you know, like up in the clouds. And, but I think that, that, the, that veil has been lifted, you know, people realize it. I mean, do you, people know that DJs aren't really, you know, doing much up there most of the time, but they're cool with that. Like they're mm -hmm. just there for the experience, the community to, you know, just let loose for the night. And you have somebody up there that was able to facil facilitate that for them in one way, you know, or another. It's kind of cool. It's nice when there's a big name and there's a big face and all that. It makes it more exciting, but like, um, you know, the way that, everything is now especially with social media like you know you can't really expect everything to be so untouchable and, and guarded mm -hmm. so it, it it it's both good and bad you know it does it opens up a lot of channels for some great connections i gotta ask um how did you and dr disrespect hook up because he's been one of my favorite streamers for forever now and i gotta know how that happened yeah um that's really cool so i mentioned zed earlier so he knows uh, that I make retro wave, synth wave, like I do that. That's that's my forte. You know, I love doing that. And uh, Doc approached him about doing some music together, and he was working on some stuff that just gave him like no time to do anything extra. And he, the first thing he did was refer Doc to me. He's like, you, know, my buddy Dave, he's like really good at that. You should hit him up. So so Doc's manager reached out to me. And then once we agreed that it was cool, we, we were going to do this, Doc and I would just, uh, I, I would start putting tracks together, send them to Doc. If he liked the vibe, we would just go back and forth on voice notes all night. I'd be working on my computer. He'd be at his home studio and uh, he'd just start top lining, you know, and coming up with the the melody for the vocals and the hooks. And yeah, so it, we, we kind of were on the same page. Like I knew the imagery he was going mm -hmm. for. And uh, he's a very, what's cool about Doc is he's really visual, you know, like he's, he's a cinematic guy. So he's kind of describing what he's seeing when all this is happening, like the Lamborghini rolls up and they're at this dance, you know, <laughs> thing or whatever. Like, um, so it was easy to work with him in that sense, because I knew exactly, like, I, I think the same way when I'm writing a song, I'm like, oh, there's holograms and there's rain coming through the holograms and, you know, stuff like that just goes through my mind so that was really really fun um i like i like vibing out with doc about music and stuff because he has really cool taste um he's one of those people that like can be a fan of music and appreciate music but he doesn't make it himself you know uh from an instrumentation standpoint but it's 100 percent in his dna you know so yeah. like if he were to just walk away from streaming and just become a musician i think he would have great success <laughs> oh yeah for sure um you've also been i i found this out not too long ago you were into magic the gathering pretty hard for a little bit there oh i still am yeah <laughs> <laughs> still am yeah i've been i've been playing since i was a little kid and uh they came out with uh magic the gathering arena the basically mobile and mm. pc title and ever because of that it was perfect because covid like nobody wanted to go play magic in person and uh, a lot of times i just don't have the time to do that myself either so it's nice to just hop on arena. I make my coffee in the morning. I play arena for a little bit and just kind of settle my mind. And then I get to work and do whatever I'm going to do. But yeah, I, I still play. I look at all the new cards coming out. I, I'm like, I get excited about them. You know, I still make decks and my cousin's a big uh, Magic the Gathering fan as well. He's the one that got me into it. So we'll, we'll get on the phone sometimes if I'm stuck in traffic and it's the best way to kill time. We just talk about magic. We're like, dude, these new cards are coming out. <laughs> this is going to be so fun to do this, that, and the other. So yeah, I'm still, still super into it. I'm a, I'm a huge geek. I've, I am as well. I've, I've been like, I've been heavily debating on getting into it, but I feel like it's just such an undertaking to first get into it, especially now. Yeah. Like it's, it just, it, it's it seems like there's just so much to it now. They've done that with almost all mm -hmm. the card games anymore. It's just like you have to be hyper focused on it to even remotely understand it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what's nice about the the video game because it enforces the rules and these mechanics. So if you were to sit there and try to figure it out yourself, it would take forever. But when you get on the game, it's like, all right, it's just going to do it for you. You have no way around it, so you'll figure it out. You know, you learn. 
<laughs> Speaking of games, are there any other games you play, like any like Call of Duties or anything like that? Oh yeah, I'm I'm still pretty nasty on Call of Duty. I play on console, and I, I almost have a 2.0 in Warzone, like for my KD. Um, I uh, I've been playing through Dark Souls three again with mm. a bunch of my friends. A couple of them work on the the Call of Duty series. That's their their whole like life and career has been Call of Duty. So they don't want to play Call of Duty <laughs> at night. You know, they've been doing that all day. So we get on and we play Dark Souls and. Um, we just torture ourselves. My internet drops out. I lose the guys. I lose my soul. It's like, but we, we love it. We have such a good time. I'm actually, I have a date tonight with uh, Vaughn, David Vonderhaar. We're going to be playing some Dark Souls. So. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> should be, should be a fun night. That's been, that's been a nice thing about like all of this space too, is having like all the connections with gaming and stuff. Like the people you would never expect to be gamers are like super, super deep into gaming. It's kind of crazy, especially like, yeah. Well, I mean, I would say Avenged Sevenfold, but everybody knew they were because they were actually in the games there for a little while. Yeah, that's how I know Vaughn through mm. playing PUBG with Shadows, and then he would invite Vaughn on to join us, and then yeah, we we just Vaughn and me kicked it off. We've been friends ever since. That is that is one guy that I would love to have on is Game Shadows just to talk about video games for an hour and a half because <laughs> there's there's three oh, bands that, would love that there's three bands that influenced me growing up and that was good charlotte 18 visions and avenged and i've already had oh okay somebody from good charlotte on i've had somebody from 18 visions on now i'm kind of like okay i gotta this is like the the goal post here is to hit that point and i mean i stole sinister okay. gates name when i was like 14 and i've still use it to this day i've had the <laughs> same gamer tag for like yeah. 18 years now but that's yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of wild. I, I always see like a Sinister Gates reference in gamer tags. There's always like a SYN, you know, mm. Sin or Sinister, and I know it's like a reference to him. And then sometimes I see corn stuff, and I feel bad because like I'm a troll when I play COD. Like if I kill somebody, <laughs> I'm teabagging them. I'm shooting their body. So you know, I I, I remember this is one dude in one of my lobbies, and like what, I'm I can run and gun. Like I'm I'm really good at that. I'm fast. I, I get a lot a high kill game going but i love camping because it pisses people off so <laughs> i'll just spend a whole game camping one room and then i'll, I'll kill them and then i'll be teabagging them and you know and shooting their bodies and there was a guy his, his like client was corn and i was like oh man if he only knew that like <laughs> <laughs> the the touring keyboard player for corn is just trolling him right now he'd probably be pretty disappointed or he'd be stoked who knows you know like probably like oh man i just got tea back he's like funny <laughs> <laughs> oh, those man. are those are funny moments and i i think it's probably pretty common there's probably because i mean like for professional athletes for touring musicians video games are a great way to kind of burn time before it's showtime mm. and keep us from getting like super bored and depressed you know and that's how like a lot of people get into drugs and drinking is they just have too much time on their hands you know so video games is great because you're like time is flying so there's probably a lot of times where somebody's playing with their favorite musician or athlete and they're just getting teabagged by them or, or teabagging <laughs> them but <laughs> well that's the cool thing about like twitch and like kick and streaming platforms like this a lot of these guys are actually on these platforms and they'll like invite their community in for games and like that would have never been possible like even like five years ago that would have still been unheard of. But nowadays it seems like right. ever, they're trying to do as much as they possibly can to engage with their fans, especially with the mediums that we have now. Yeah. Which is awesome. And, and it just takes a little bit of time, you yeah. know, and just a couple apps and maybe a phone and it's all possible. So if there are people that don't engage with their fans, you know, that's either a, a personal choice or man, managerial choice or they just have terrible social anxiety like me <laughs> <laughs> i feel that i definitely feel that that's why this stuff is mm -hmm. like awkward for me most of the time because i'm just like oh, i'm sitting here being stared at by people <laughs> <laughs> how did you and how did you and uh, the guys in corn get hooked up because that's got to be like a big fucking deal yeah that's actually through events sevenfold so i i was uh doing the sound design and voiceovers for their mobile game mm -hmm. so if you play their mobile game i'm the voice of the main character i made all the sounds for the weapons oh, nice. and everything you hear on there except i think uh zaki's brother did the uh he did the the score or the soundtrack on that but um sorry it was a while ago <laughs> so and because of that we were like 
in the in the middle of that, Matt's super passionate about it as a gamer, so he wanted to make sure it was it was great. So he, they were like, maybe you could go on tour with us, and we can keep working on this, you know. And Johnny needed somebody to help uh, with his changeovers, so um, I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I'm not going to say no to going on tour with you guys. I had my own band I'm trying to tour with, but I was like, it's probably more advantageous to get out there with the Avenged guys, oh, yeah. get on the road with my friends, and you know. It just felt like it would be really fun, which it was. And then um, we were doing Mayhem Festival, and Corn was on it. And uh, so Brian and Fieldy from Corn and I connected pretty hard because we were all Christians. So they were like, "Yo, we we get together every now and then on the bus, and we we just read like you know we we read a little bit of a verse, and we get a little bit of wisdom, and like a little you know pep up." And we pray together and we do that all the time. And I'm like, yeah, I would love that. That's great. Cause it gets pretty dark on tour, you know? So that's always really nice. You just get in there and you get a little chestnut of wisdom, something to walk away with. So we were doing that for a while. And then um, Brian would come out to uh, California and he would visit me and my family. We just became really, really close, um, stayed in touch, did a bunch of stuff together. And then um, I had been working on The Voice. I think I was there for like six seasons, and I was just really burnt out. I was missing touring, but I was I was also like trying to break into the music department over there. So um, Brian was like, "We're we're going on tour. I think it was the Breaking Benjamin or something in a couple months." And I was like, "Yeah, I was like, is it cool if I come for like a couple weeks and just you know take a little vacation?" It's like absolutely. So I was just out there rolling, having fun, and uh, something comes up on the bus, and Fieldy walks up to me and he goes, "Oh, you want to play keyboard for us?" And I'm thinking like, man, I'm a guitar player. I don't know. But I, I use the keyboard all the time when I'm recording and producing at home. So I just said, yes. I'm like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Yeah. And I was in my head, I'm like, I don't know what that looks like. How do you even play keyboard live on stage? You know? So um, I got home and the holidays were rolling through Christmas time, New Year's. Brian came out, stayed with us. We did some more stuff. And then he gets an email from Monkey. And they're going through this keyboard thing, trying to figure it out for Europe and all this and he's like, hey, do you remember when we asked you, do you still want to do that? And I'm like, absolutely, let's do it. So he's like, cool, just like, here's some tracks, send a video to Monkey and myself, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll figure it out. So I send the video, I, I made some really cool pads that just sounded like a sub for a bass and a grain for a guitar, because it all follows the guitar and bass lines and just fattens it up, you know. Because um, they at the time, they weren't using tracks at all. It was all just like like natural, just raw instrumentation. Um so I sent the video and Monkey was like, tell him he's in and he's going to do Europe with us. And if that works out, great. You know, so we did Europe and it, it was awesome. Like I had a really good time, just clicked immediately. Um, those guys are some of my favorite people in the world. You know, they're, they're like family to me. And uh, we just, we had an awesome time. But, uh, you know, uh, I think I think we brought in a second keyboard eventually. We brought in like a Moog. Uh, Voyager and that that's like a pretty classic live part of the uh or part of the live sound for corn like the older tracks was all on that Moog and then I had my um MPK MIDI controllers and I was running like Reason because that's all I knew so I was making all my pads on Reason but it's like low CPU so I wasn't worried about the computers like freezing or overheating mm -hmm. and then you know just blowing it in front of 200,000 people <laughs> um so that worked out really well and then I I just uh recently like started using um oh what i can't even remember right now i can't think about it but i think it's called like main stage or something like that i don't know but it's what it's the live program for logic and th that can actually like run these crazy vsts and plugins i use in real time so that's that's been pretty cool too i'm, I'm looking forward to doing that for all the damn vampires I've been trying to get into all that. I have a MPK mini, but it's just like, ah, uh, just programs are just so crazy. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Good. I good. think that was me. It's probably, probably my trash spectrum. Wi -Fi. <laughs> hey, I am on spectrum Wi-Fi too. And I hate every second of it is, and it's so yeah. expensive for no reason. Like why? <laughs> And if, if I if I ever go to jail, it's probably because I met the guy that designed Spectrum Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was like, I was trying to get into all of it, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a guitar player at heart, so like trying to do all of that stuff is just kind of like trying to learn a different language, basically, for me. Yeah, I feel you there. I, I mean, I, I do everything by ear, so yeah. it's like if physically I can make it make sense, 
and I can hear it, then I could just do it, you know, wrap my head around it. So I'm not going to rip into like some Beethoven or anything, <laughs> yeah. but I knew enough. I knew enough to get through the set. You know, I can, and with chord, it's cool because you're the key, the keyboards is basically what most bands will put on tracks. You know, this, those extra layers of fat sub and extra grain and distortion. And it was, it was cool because like some nights, you know, feel these bass would go out or, or Brian's uh, guitar pedal board would like break because he's really he stomps it pretty hard mm. so i would take over in those gaps you know and it would still sound really full it was kind of cool i think i think they they're doing it more scaled down now so that i think they're using tracks and no live keys but um i definitely think there's a certain magic to them not being on tracks like it just mm. gave it that real like hearty kind of musicians like feeling you know yeah um so how do you feel about all the uh, like digital guitar amps now? Are you a, are you a real like physical amp guy, or did have you gotten into the digital stuff? I my favorite thing that I bought in the last five years is my Kemper, so uh, I use that. I, I, I'm all for minimizing, dropping the weight down, mm-hmm. just getting everything in the box. I love plugins. I love VSTs. A lot of synth guys like they want to collect these vintage synths, and you know. That's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not for me. I don't want to have the extra storage space, the extra weight. Right. If I can do it all, you know, digitally, I'm going to do it all digitally. I just think it's smart, and it it gets you past the setup phase right into the creative, you know, aspects of it. Right. I've been looking uh, at helixes. I've been debating it myself. Uh, I just toured uh, with a friend's band, and I had a uh, what was it? It was hers. It was a a line six pod HD thing. It was a rack mounted thing made everything oh, so, so those. much easier. Like I just brought my guitar and that was it. Everything else was in a rack. I didn't have any yeah. pedals. I had nothing. It was just plugged straight into that. And I was good to go. It was so convenient yeah. and perfect. <laughs> I used to use those pod HD uh, amp modelers. I loved them. Like you get the heaviest tone. I would, I would use those to record stuff for my project, the destroyer. And like other producers would hear it and be like, dude, you got to give me that guitar tone. And I'm like, nah, that's my, my tone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was through a pod. It wasn't like, you know, I used, I'd use like a Mesa boogie live and all that, but man, I probably have like permanent nerve damage in my back from like hauling gear on oh. tours and stuff. Like <laughs> at you one, know, so I, at one time I had a 5153 and a Mesa 412 and never again, that, that thing was yeah. just extra weight that didn't even need to be extra weight. Those heads are so heavy. Yeah. Yeah. We used to like, we worked out just based on the fact that we wanted the strength to just look like one hand our cabs and, you know, just load in and out of venues. Like that was like the driving force behind like (laughs) working out, not just to be like buff or whatever. Like, I mean, by the time I joined Winds of Plague, um, you know, I I used to look at pictures of John and be like, man, he's jacked and then I, I got on stage and i'm like yeah dude i'm jacked too like i'm the same size as john like you know but but it's like it's more uh it's more utility than anything because you gotta haul this heavy ass gear oh, so yeah. that's not that's an era i don't want to be a part of anymore i'm like give me my little <laughs> kemper airplane carry on you know plug it directly into the house the cat five cable whatever you gotta do like i don't know but you know i just don't want to uh be hauling gear like that anymore it just seems egregious <laughs> especially now like you can have all of your stuff on a usb in your pocket and if you have to go mm-hmm. somewhere and your stuff's not working okay let me go get one from the guitar store real quick plug in and be good to go like you can't do that when you have 30 pedals and an amp and a cab and all that so it's it's more convenient for sure yeah yeah and I, as a guitar player I'm, i was always just like give me a noise suppressor a tuner and maybe a delay pedal and that's as far as i go like that's all i want <laughs> yep i agree <laughs> uh when yeah. did you get hooked up with uh five finger oh five finger was uh right before last fall i i got like an instagram message from zoltan's day-to-day um assistant and it was like, hey, uh, are you still playing with Corn right now? And I was like, no, no, I'm not. It's like, do you want to play for Five Finger Death Punch? And I was like, yeah, like, I'm, I think I feel like, because in my mind, it's like, okay, if I'm going to tour with somebody right now, I want to be at the same level as Corn as far as like um, how we're rolling, you know, what what the situation like on tour. I want to be in a, a bus and I want to be in good hotels. I just want to be comfortable, you know, because mm-hmm. touring sucks, especially in like the winter time. Like, you know, you just, you don't want to be, um, 
you don't want to be on a tight budget. It's it's never fun that way. Maybe when you're younger, because there's other driving forces for it. But for me, I'm like, I just want to. I want to do these shows the best I can, and I want to go home, and I don't want to feel like I got hit by a truck. So, so that that was kind of you know where my mindset was, and I was like, yeah, if I figure like they've been around a while. You know, I, I wasn't super familiar with with any of their stuff at the time. Um, but I said yes, and then uh, I get on the phone call with him and. He's like, yeah. He's like, uh, we leave in four days. I was like, what? Was like, four <laughs> days. I was like, what am I learning? And he sent me like, you know, a list of like 14 songs. And I was like, I have four days, 14 songs. I called uh, Chris who plays keyboards for Under Oath because he's like brilliant when it comes to setting up rigs and stuff. And I was thinking what I used for corn was perfect for corn because I built it for them. But if I'm going to do keyboards for five finger, I don't even know like how many tracks actually have keyboards. Like I'm going to have to learn new stuff. I'm going to learn on the fly. I'm going to learn what I can. So the goal was to just build this like kind of adaptive rig that would, would work out. So I get out there, I have that all put together and then we get to rehearsals and the conversation is like, yo, can you sing? And I was like, oh, I've been singing since I was a kid. I took vocal lessons. Uh, any of my my close friends will tell you that we will go to karaoke. Nobody will crush like Careless Whispers or Chris Isaac <laughs> like me. So <laughs> so uh, I was like, let's do it. You know, I can, I can sing for sure. So it actually ended up being like maybe two songs that I played keyboard on. And then I would, com I composed a bunch of really cool, like produced interludes between, uh, songs on the set and then i was singing and i was singing like basically you know you could call it backup vocals but i, I was like second vocals you know because mm -hmm. i'm singing all the harmonies with ivan if ivan's like trying to be interactive with the crowd and he's off his mic i'm jumping in and doing his part you know so um it was like a really interactive 14 weeks of uh, a lot of singing more than i've ever done uh in a professional capacity um so that that all happened through like an instagram message but those guys um are awesome we we hit it off really well and we had a lot of fun it was it, a lot of days it was like me zoltan uh charlie ingen and annie james and we were like just you know laughing our asses off at memes talking about you know all kinds of cool philosophy and stuff and and music just having little listening parties and stuff um so yeah those those guys are are badass um hopefully i'll i'll be back with them doing some stuff probably after a lot of the metallica runs and whatever um but uh I wonder, yeah, you might, you might hear, like, if you hear their live shows now, they might even use some of the interludes I composed, but really, really cool guys. And I, I had a great time out with them. Nice. Do you, do you find it hard to find time for all of this? Cause you seem like a really, really busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it's, a, it's kind of a balance. So yeah, the time is hard to find. But I also have a lot of quiet time, like, cause it's just like recharging, you know? Mm. So, from a from an outside perspective it might look like oh like you didn't do anything today i'm like no no i i did what i needed to do i i recharged off the grid like because yeah i do stack a lot of stuff on my plate and like hit a lot of different projects from different directions so it is hard and uh you know i try not to like put myself in front of people or in a collaborative situation when i'm like not in a good mood or you know just like burnt out because i just don't think it's fair you know so the time is uh is definitely valuable to me these days like before i never really regarded it as such now i'm like if i get an hour to go you know take a hike or go down to the beach that's priceless to me so i really try to protect that that time and not let people take that from me whereas before i'd be like yeah i could sacrifice that you know i got to make this happen i think it's it's important and I, I hope everybody can like you know have that realization at some point to kind of let themselves come down and just like be by themselves for a little bit or just like clear out their head. I think that's really important in a healthy way. Right. Right. Like, I feel like, like you had said, if you're in front of people and you have like a negative vibe in you, like they can feel it right away, like instantly. Yeah. Cause like the energy totally. you put out versus the energy that comes in is like, I believe in that like crazy, like you have to put positive energy out for positive energy in at all times. Cause if you're just always yeah. negative, you're just going to get negative back at all times. So like, if I'm sitting here, like I'm playing Fortnite or something and everything starts going bad and I'm just like, Oh God, this is stupid. I hate this. I'm just like, well, I know everybody can feel that. So I got to like back off for a little while, but yeah, I agree a thousand yeah. percent. It's important, man. Like, it, you know, I've, I learned a lot just with like this NFT project. Um, I was doing like six to eight hours a day on Twitter spaces to kind of just build community and tell people, you know, what I had going on. And, 
I would leave that feeling mentally exhausted because you'd have so many different personalities and so many energies in there. And you have these people trying to hustle in there, people coming in there inventing about like, you know, being ripped off or losing uh, money in the web three space. And I'm taking all that on, whether I know it or not, you know, in the back of my head. Mm. And then um, with this project, like I had a team and then there was like a dude on the team that was like promising all this stuff and not delivering. And it's, it was like, I was just getting more and more like burnt out and mad about it. I'm like, I got to step away from this, man. I, there's no way I could get in these spaces and be genuine. And, and then you, you go on your community and that's reflective, you know, or you have people in there that look at it as like, I don't care about the art. This is an investment for me. So why aren't you doing a, B and C? Like I want all this. And I'm just like, dude, that that's not to me. Like if you're a creative person, you, you do it for the joy of creating and you mm -hmm. love seeing how people receive that and then you see these people looking at it analytically like it's a you know like a stock chart and it's it just totally takes you out of it so i'm really just like putting my foot down and just being like okay i'm, I'm approaching things the way i want to approach it and i'm going to be honest about it if someone we, someone we wants to throw down with me over it let's throw it down but like you know i'm not going to just like change my tune because somebody's complaining or you know i i really stand by the fact that i I don't want to be around negative energy and negative people. So right. I think I think that's an important standpoint to take because you also teach those people like they're not going to, it's not going to be put up with, you know, don't keep doing that. Like <laughs> take it somewhere else. Right. And that's like the, like people who like basically live on Twitter and they're always complaining about how negative their lives are. And then you go and look at what they're like sharing and retweeting and everything. And it's just negative shit all the time. And it's like, you're surrounding yourself with it. How do you not realize that, that is why you're so negative all the time because you surround yourself totally. with the negative energy. Yeah. Yeah. Shadows said uh, the best thing ever to me. He said, post and ghost. I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's you're actually right, dude. not like, bad. <laughs> yeah. I never like nurtured my, my Twitter the way I did with my Instagram, you know, to build up some kind of crazy following or anything like that. So I was really new to it. I didn't understand it that much. So, you know, I'm just now like getting to a point where I enjoy scrolling a Twitter feed because I, you know, made it to where I follow things I want to see. I'm actually like interested, like, oh, cool, a UFO video or something, you know. <laughs> but for a while, I was just like, yeah, I can't stand opening Twitter, you know. Yeah. And then now it like shows you stuff that you're not even following anymore. And it's just like, man, I don't want to see half this shit. Like, it makes you just not want to yeah. use social media at all. But with doing stuff like this, I have to use social media. It's the only way that it's going to grow. So it's like a catch 22. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good things to come from. I'm not going to totally like dog on it, right. but for sure, like it, the flaws sometimes seem like they might outweigh the benefits. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite genre to write in? Ooh, that's uh, that's tough, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, obviously, like I really took on synth pop and synth wave. Like that was just so fun for me to write because it's so visual. So I would say that that's probably up there, like maybe top three. Um, I really like scoring horror, like anything scary. I feel like that's really fun. Like, let me get, let me get some sounds some pads, you know, and, and create these melodies and just any, yeah, that, I guess that's the common denominator is, is, is it visual? Um, I just did four like really heavy tracks that I'm going to do something with. I don't know what yet, but I want to develop an entire album for that and figure it out. But those tracks were so fun to write. Um, they uh they kind of have all the elements i like the, the groovy they're heavy they're dark you know so um those kind of three elements like darker heavier music cinematic music that might go better with horror or thrillers and then of course the synth stuff like synth wave retro wave those are my my top three for sure um i've talked about this with a few guests and stuff but with like live shows do you feel like a band has to put on more of a visual live show now to keep people like invested in it? Because with like with social media, everybody's so quick about just going to something else. Like they swipe really fast. Like I feel like you have to have a, not necessarily a gigantic stage set up, but you got to have something. You got to have something to keep the visuals intact. Like you can stand up on stage and play the songs perfectly all day. But if you're just standing there, a lot of people aren't going to like connect with it yeah i mean i wouldn't use the word half words have to right. um 
but I think you should like, and the reason I say that is because it's true. There's oversaturation and there's a lot out there now. Like, you know, every release radar on your Spotify is going to give you a new artist you never knew about if, if you let it. So like uh, I'll use ghosts as an example. I don't think ghosts would have been anywhere near as big as they are. They're, the music's cool. Like it's mm -hmm. for people for sure. There's people that are going to love it, but it's not like groundbreaking. It's nothing we haven't heard before. Right. But the visuals, that was cool. That everybody was like, "Whoa, this looks rad!" And then you hear the music, and you're like, oh, "This almost doesn't match it, but I get it. It's cool." Right. So, I think that's really important to have some sort of visual aspect that makes you stand out. I mean, you could look at Marshmallow, you could look at Dead Mouse. Like, they they they're all really good at what they do, and there's a place for them. But you add that extra element, and um, you become like an icon, you know, and, and you stay in people's heads. So it's, it's something for everybody to go see and go enjoy. So I, if I had to advise like a band, I'd be like, yeah, make sure you come up with something cool. Maybe it's not a gimmick. Maybe it's a more uniform look, but make it something, you know, nobody wants to watch a bunch of dudes in there, like jeans and t-shirts, like go up there and play breakdowns. The, the only reason bands that do that are doing good is because they already had a community or they had all those friends that just like, poured out love to him because that's their their friday night party is like going to chain reaction and seeing their their buddies you know and they hardcore dance and all that like those kind of things they work out in different ways but i think if if people don't understand it you know because you'll look at like a lot of bands that got really big and their old material is super heavy like look at bring me the horizon right like mm. it's just so so heavy now they write stuff that you could hear on a car commercial you know and that's not a bad thing but like they would not have broken out like that because they're not going to be able to bring people to a live show playing the car commercial music right. like people are going to be falling asleep they want to go there for that energy and for the breakdowns and the heaviness so you got to start there you know you got to draw people in and then you, then if you want to take your creative liberties like you can go there that's kind of the natural evolution of all artists like they start kind of doing what they more more so listen to on their off time i listen to like a lot of R&B, hip hop, pop music. So I'll be walking around a festival. I'm playing with say corn or five finger. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm burnt out. All I hear is, doo, 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 you know, just, I got PTSD yeah. from all the double <laughs> kick and screams. So I'm, I'm putting on some R&B and I'm just walking around enjoying that. Of course, if somebody was like, Hey, you can still, you know, make a decent living and tour playing R&B now and you don't have to do metal. I, I take a little bit of that, that chance. So yeah, I think that, um, you know, just the misconceptions are, you know, certain certain misconceptions have been living for a while. But these are things I always think about and I always want to talk about with other artists and, you know, just like even people that are just fans of music, you know, because people are very uh, aggressive about their genres and their allegiances, especially in metal and rock, you know. I, I'm not a fan of genres anymore because there's so much genre blending anymore that it's – you there's so many sub genres now too, that it's like, it's almost pointless. Like it's just, it's good music. Just enjoy it yeah. for what it is. And ghost is yeah, one of my I mean, favorite bands of all time. I've got like mm -hmm. ghost tattoos all over the place. And that was like my main example for that was that yeah. they have this giant stage set up and costume changes and all of that stuff. Like you, that is a totally. full on show. Yeah. That's the theatrics are, are really important. Um, you know, it's it's when you look at things and you try to actively break it down into genres and and try to dissect that. Um, that's for you know, like musicians, it'd be like a chef, right? You got your spice rack. Mm. People are like coming in, like, oh, is this is this Mexican food? Is this Italian food? But the the chef is just like, well, I'm not looking at it like that. Like, I have a recipe, and I'm just gonna grab from all these things, you know. And then here's the main dish. It doesn't matter if it was like salt based, acidic based, you know. There's salsa in it, like, like that. That's kind of with musicians too, you know. It's like we're not looking at our subgenres unless that was the goal in the beginning. Like, let's make a blah 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 mm. but if you just are like this is the music i write naturally yeah it kind of sounds like this genre or whatever but that doesn't matter like you know just ghost is ghost avenge is avenged you know um that's that's like the in my opinion i think the most um lucrative way to look at things to be able to enjoy multiple spectrums and just like enjoy music but yeah there's just a lot of people that they need that kind of guidance where it's broken down for them mm. like here you go red light green light Here's a here's a deathcore band. Here's a metalcore band. Like, you know, yeah. to me, I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's heavy. It's heavy music. It's metal. Awesome. Whatever. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All 
All right. So before we end this, what do you have coming up next music wise? So I'm working on a concept instrumental EP, which might actually end up being a full length. I just have to decide for all the damn vampires. And uh, that's going to be called Retro Future Soundscapes. And uh, I'm looking to tokenize the art for that. So I'm going to do like a specific release that's going to be a Web3 based one. So you'll get the, the music, but you'll also have the art as an NFT, you know, for people that are into that. And then also, you know, just on DSPs, some digital streaming platforms that'll be released everywhere. Uh, I'm working on this this heavy stuff right now. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but um, I'm pretty stoked on it. And I've been sending it around within my uh, my friends within the industry and everybody's pretty hyped on it. So I might might get some cool, some cool vocalists on it, you know, do something exciting with it. We'll see. Um, that's about it. I, I'm, I'm just on the grind. I'm just doing music and art like every day and uh i'm on i'm under nda for a few things i can't talk about but those will be really cool too <laughs> so yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm busy for sure that's that's the, the truth of it well i appreciate you taking the time to come on and everything um for me honestly like when i hear saturday it just reminds me of that early days of grinding and just like meeting everybody and all that so it's been on my playlist constantly for about three years now so i'm Thank just you. super stoked that I was able to finally get you on because we've been working on this for a hot minute now. I think it was like November yeah. when I first hit you up. Yeah, I got to I got to take the the uh, the blame for that one. I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> it's all uh, good. <laughs> sometimes I'm a, I'm a little hard to lock down for social stuff because I'm like, oh. but I, I, you made my day telling me that about Saturday. That you know that song's my heart and soul. Like that's literally me looking at my my childhood from a perspective of seeing my my older sister and her friends you know in the like late 80s early 90s and just seeing how much fun they were having and seeing the world you know just from that perspective and the existential dread of having to go back to school on monday so you know it was <laughs> like it's all all wrapped into those melodies and then made, of course made that that song what it is now so um yeah, man. Thank you. You, oh. you really made my day with that. Oh, I appreciate of course, it. of course. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and call it there. I appreciate you stopping on again. Hopefully you have a great day and everything. Absolutely. And I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yep. See ya.